Voilà, j'ouvre cette dernière petite session consacrée donc aux perspectives internationales. Et évidemment, c'est un très grand plaisir pour nous d'accueillir Pippa Shirley, nos collègues anglais, donc conservateur en chef du, au château de Waddesdon, et Tom Stammers dans un instant, professeur à l'université de Durham. Et euh, juste deux mots pour souligner euh, l'importance, évidemment, de donner une perspective internationale à euh, ces recherches sur euh, les Rothschild. Et évidemment, ces euh, trois jours de communication ont bien montré, hein, euh, finalement, qu'il ne fallait pas réduire l'étude de ce mécénat Rothschild à la France. Donc, euh, vraiment, je me réjouis euh, voilà, de, de la venue de Pippa Shirley, d'autant que, évidemment, les Anglais, en fait, ont été très précoces euh, dans l'historiographie, dans tout le travail euh, d'historiographie euh, des collections Rothschild, puisque on se rappelle que euh, l'étude de ces collections a commencé avec la publication en 1967, euh, qui est le premier livre de Ellis Waterhouse euh, sur les peintures conservées au château de Waddesdon, et euh, qui avait été donc impulsé par Dorothy Rothschild. Et on connaît évidemment l'importance de ces ouvrages, de ces 15 ouvrages de référence hein, sur les collections de Waddesdon, dont va nous parler euh, évidemment euh, Pippa Shirley. Alors, euh, Pippa Shirley, donc, euh, euh, après sa thèse à euh, l'Institut Courtois à Londres, est devenue conservateur ou conservatrice plutôt au British Museum, au département euh, d'art médiéval, puis au Victorian Albert Museum. Donc elle a fait une grande carrière euh, dans euh, les musées et elle s'est spécialisée dans les arts décoratifs, notamment l'argenterie et les arts du métal. Et d'ailleurs, c'est à ce titre hein, que je crois qu'on lui doit l'aménagement des nouvelles galeries euh, du Viennet. Depuis 2000, l'an 2000, euh, Pippa Shirley est donc euh, conservatrice en chef des collections de Bois des Donnes, en charge des arts décoratifs. Et je crois qu'elle a ajouté depuis deux ans euh, l'aménagement des jardins, c'est oui, ça oui, oui, Voilà, du parc vrai. et l'entretien du parc. Et ces nombreuses publications, évidemment, vont porter euh, sur, enfin, portent sur euh, les arts décoratifs et le collectionnisme euh, en Angleterre. Alors, elle va, euh, dans un instant, nous éclairer donc, sur la personnalité de Alice de Rothschild, euh, dont on a vu hier euh, la passion euh, très insolite pour les pipes, qu'elle avait euh, exposé dans sa villa de grâce, vraiment comme des véritables trophées. Donc il y a une sorte de clin d'œil, euh, puisqu'on on a vu ces, ces boucliers euh, très étonnants, euh, trophées de chasse et la collection d'armes euh, d'Alice de Rothschild, euh, qui euh, l'a constituée euh, et qui marque, donc, euh, là aussi, euh, est un, un intérêt euh, assez particulier. Mais vous allez nous en dire plus. Merci, merci, merci Pauline. Um, I'm very sorry, I'm going to start with an apology because I'm going to speak to you in English. Um, I, I do apologize. All I can say is that you would not want me to speak to you in French. So um, I have lots of pictures though, so I hope that that, that, that will be enjoyable. Um, and I'm also just going to, to start by saying that um, I am going to talk to you about uh, Alice de Rothschild and her collections of arms and armour, but first I'm going to take you on a little um, tour d'horizon, um, because I think you can't really understand Alice without first understanding Wadston Manor itself and her, her wider collecting. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time um, just to introduce you, for those of you who perhaps don't know the house, just to introduce you to um, Wadston. Um, I mean, Alice uh, has a wonderful pedigree as a collector, um, but attention has been very much more focused, I think, on her more famous brother, Ferdinand, um, who, as we all know, probably was a collector extraordinaire who built Wadsden and assembled within it and in his London house um, on Piccadilly, and it's important we don't forget the London houses of the Rothschilds, a collection that became renowned even in Ferdinand's own day. Um, Alice was Ferdinand's closest relative and his heir. Uh, she inherited Wadsden in 1922, having lived there with her brother since the house was built. Um, she was also a collector in her own right, collecting in a familiar Rothschild pattern, but in some areas, her collecting showed marked individuality, I would say, and one such area was her collecting of arms and armor, which was certainly part of an interest, a broad interest in the material culture of the 16th and 17th centuries, but was also unusual at the time, and particularly for a woman. Um, indeed, I'm not aware of any other example of a female collecting this kind of material on such a large scale. And I'd be very interested to know, you can all tell me I'm wrong at the end, but I'd be very interested to know if any of you know of other um, examples of this, of this kind of collecting. 
So, to set Al Alice in context, um, we need first to take a quick look at her brother, Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild, who was born in 1839, um, the son of a Viennese Rothschild, Anselm, and an English Rothschild mother, Charlotte. He married an English cousin and was always Anglophile, and so moved to England in 1859. He lived on Piccadilly in London, but built Wadsden as a country retreat, a place where he could entertain friends and family, but also as a kind of treasure house, a fitting setting for his growing collection. And his French architect, Gabriel Hippolyte Détailleur, did indeed come up with something of appropriate grandeur, a French Renaissance chateau on the outside, an 18th century Parisian mansion on the inside. Um, from the moment he purchased the Wadsden estate in 1874, Ferdinand embarked on a monumental effort to create the house and its grounds on a site which, by his own account, there was not a bush to be seen or a bird to be heard when he started out. The top of the hill was completely levelled, the drives and terraces excavated, water had to be piped in from Aylesbury, which is a town about um, six kilometres away, and materials brought to site on a specially constructed railway. Mature trees were imported to landscape the grounds, and mounds and grottos of artificial pull and rock were, were made to house a menagerie of exotic species. Benjamin Disraeli, who witnessed the building of the manor, is said to have commentated, commented that the Almighty would have accomplished the creation of the world in rather less than seven days if he'd had the assistance of the Rothschilds. <laughs> Um, I know that we aren't talking particularly about um, interiors today, but this is really just to give you a glimpse inside the house, one of the finest examples of Le Gour Rothschild. So here we have opulent interiors in which magnificent English 18th century portraits look down from silk hung or carved panelled walls onto the finest examples of 18th century French marquetry furniture, Sèvres and mice and porcelain, Savonnerie carpets woven for French royal palaces. And this was, of course, as you all know, was the taste which was to prove so influential for the super wealthy plutocrats across the Atlantic at the turn of the century. And a collection which, of course, was to become famous in its owner's own lifetime. So just to show you the outside, um, the house and the garden were designed as an integrated whole, each critical to the visual appreciation of the other. The garden was a mixture of French-inspired formality and English parkland vistas laid out with a focal point of a view or a piece of sculpture at every turn and with several destinations for visitors, including, of course, an aviary, which you can see here. Um, and this is the Pullum Rock I was talking about um, earlier uh, with the sheep and, and goat and animal pens. Um, and this is the huge range of glass houses, the largest in private hands at the time, down at the bottom of the hill. Sadly, they're no longer there at Wadston. Um, and then there was an, auto, um, an ornamental dairy with a Pullum rock and water garden. So, um, Alice inherited the manor on Ferdinand's death in 1898. And from the very start, she seems to have been determined to preserve and enhance her brother's creation. It's in large part thanks to Alice that Wadsden and its collections remain in such pristine condition to this day. Oh, sorry, that was out of order. There is the Pullum Rock and the Dairy Water Garden and some 19th century visitors. So a little bit of biography. Um, Alice was born in 1847, the youngest daughter of the eight children of Anselm, who we've already heard was from the Viennese branch of the family, and his English cousin Charlotte, who was the daughter of Nathan Mayer of the London branch. Um, although the Rothschilds habitually married within the family, the English origin of Alice's mother was important since it seems to have instilled in her children a deep affection for Britain. And certainly it was a determining factor in Ferdinand and then Alice deciding to settle in, in, um, in England. Like her siblings, Alice's childhood was divided between Paris, Frankfurt, where the family had a villa at Grunenberg, Vienna, and holidays in the country estate in Silesia, at Schillersdorf, where they reveled in riding and walking, and Alice was able to indulge her undoubted skill for drawing and for music. And this is a page from her sketchbook. Her, and the sketchbooks, two of which survive at Wadston, show she had a good eye and was keenly observant, um, and that she also had an eye for and an interest in landscape. Like Ferdinand, she also spent a good deal of time with her mother's family in England, particularly at Gunnersbury. But the untimely death of her mother in 1859, when Alice was only 12, saw the start of a rootless phase, as in the words of her aunt Charlotte, she became a real shuttle clock 
flung from the home of one compassionate relative under the roof of some other commiserating friend, flying, travelling, rushing, from the south of Germany to the north, from the country to the seaside, from Imperial Austria to Royal Prussia, from Switzerland to Italy, from Silesia to England, and all because she has an ugly face and no mother to love her. That was her aunt saying that. However, despite this, she still managed to form some exceptionally strong bonds, in particular with her cousins Constance and Annie, daughters of her uncle Anthony, and she stayed on many occasions at Aston Clinton, their country house on the other side of Aylesbury from Wadston. And this is one of several detailed sketches that Alice made of the house and park, all the more valuable now since the house was demolished after the Second World War. And the, these bonds are to be reinforced, and Alice, aged 20, arrived from Vienna to join Ferdinand in England following the early death of his young wife, Evelina. They lived together, first in London, where Alice bought the adjoining house to his, 142 Piccadilly, and at Leighton House in Leighton Buzzard, from where they both enjoyed hunting with the Rothschild staghounds. The death of their father, Anselm, in 1874 left them both independently wealthy, and Ferdinand immediately embarked on the building of Wadston and his collection. At the same time, Alice purchased the adjoining estate at Ethrop where she employed local architect George Devey to build her a house. And you might be able to see the tiny writing down at the bottom. Um, this photograph is annotated, My Cottage. Um, it was to be a day residence only, though. After a bout of rheumatic fever, she was told she shouldn't sleep by water. So Ferdinand provided her with a bedroom and a sitting room at Wadston. And here is a rather fanciful portrait of Alice riding out with the Rothschild staghounds. We have a memoir of Alice from her cousin, Constance, in which she described her as gifted with a manly intellect and a firm sense of duty, also an unusually strong power of will and a flexibility of purpose. She pursued her way of life, carrying out her improvements, managing her property, looking after every detail of her estate, undeterred by any opposition she might meet with. No freaks or changes in fashion worried or affected her. She had never been good-looking, but had keen, bright eyes, a thoughtful brow, and something unusual and arresting in appearance and expression. She was most precise and punctual in all her habits, visiting daily her gardens and glass houses and farm, her aviary of rare birds, managing personally every department of her property, and never resting until perfectly satisfied with what she saw. No detail, however small, escaped her notice. Her knowledge, indeed, covered a wide ground, for she was well acquainted with the art, literature, and history of many countries. She was most interested in animal life, loving her dogs devotedly, and was generally followed by some wonderful specimen of their race. Original in mind and speech, she had a great sense of humour and could express herself easily and with point in three languages. So she was doing much better than I am today. The period between the death of her mother and her settling in England with Ferdinand must have had a very profound impact on her character and personality, and her itinerant existence meant that she formed strong bonds with those closest to her, initially with her governess, Cecile Hofer, seen here in a drawing by Alice, who later became her constant companion and was succeeded in turn by Clarissa Watkin, to whom on her death Alice bequeathed all her personal effects, private correspondence, clothes, jewels, her two dogs, and the contents of her London house, 142 Piccadilly, as well as those of Mrs. Watkins' own sitting room at Wadston. She must also have developed a high degree of self-reliance, and her independence of mind and spirited is well documented by those close to her. Her innate reserve, though, seems to have hardened into a forceful, not to say formidable, personality, and stories of her strictness are legion, but for those of her who knew her well, her personality held great charm. Alice entered into every aspect of Ferdinand's life, both at Wadston and in London, dividing her time between the two from 1880 onwards when the first part of the house, the bachelor's wing, was ready for occupation. This was marked by the first of her brother's many house parties, which became legendary in their day for luxury and hospitality. These Saturday to Monday parties at Wadston followed a fairly regular pattern. Sumptuous meals cooked by Ferdinand's French chef, a round of visits to the gardens, aviary and dairy where the guests could taste the milk and cream, and of course a huge range of glass houses and the water garden. 
Um, Alice would then normally invite the whole party across the estate to Ethrop, where they would admire the gardens and have tea beside the river. And on these occasions, she mingled easily with Ferdinand's friends, including the Prince of Wales, later Edward VII, and others from his political circle. This familiarity with the manor made Alice the obvious choice when the childless Ferdinand came to select his heir, and on his death in 1898, Alice became the Chatelaine of Wadston. From the outset, she seems to have, have, have seen her role as one of both perpetuating the life that he had lived and preserving his legacy. She continued to host house parties, although on a reduced scale, and only twice a year. She continued to collect, and she continued to pour her energies into the gardens, both at Wadston and at Ethrop. Guests who included Sir Winston Churchill, Lord Kitchener, and Henry James continued to enjoy every possible luxury, although some visitors found their hostess could be both intimidating and a little strange. Ottoline Morell, who visited in 1909, later described Alice as a lonely old oddity. Henry James, who was clearly rather fond of her and made several visits, found lunch attended by enormously tall footmen and with huge white strawberries for dessert, rather oppressive. Even King Edward VII, who made a nostalgic visit to his old friend's house in 1906, was famously told to keep his hands off the furniture. <laughs> this concern to protect the collection was manifested in what became later known as Miss Alice's Rules, which remain a significant force today in the house and the management of the collections. As we've already heard, Wadsden was not only a weekend retreat in which to entertain family and friends, it was also the setting for Ferdinand's chief passion, his collection. Alice witnessed the formation of this collection, the magnificent 18th century English portraits, the Sèvres porcelain, the French 18th century furniture, Savonnerie carpets, gold boxes, and so on, which must have been a major influence on the formation of her own taste, a taste which she exercised while Ferdinand was alive, but more energetically after his death. She, of course, had her own houses to furnish, 142 Piccadilly, and later, Ethrop. She must also have been aware of the collections other members of the family were forming, or had formed, such as her cousin Alfred at Halton, though she did not, as far as we know, record her responses. She would also have come into contact with connoisseurs outside the family circle. She knew the famous collection assembled by, by the Marquis of Hertford and Sir Richard Wallace, now, of course, the Wallace Collection, and is recorded in the visitor's book there with Ferdinand in 1885. In broad terms, her taste seems to have followed familial lines, with some notable exceptions. An extremely early colour view of her sitting room at the manor, taken around 1910, shows an interior with a savonnerie on the floor, red silk hung walls, densely hung with a variety of works on paper, including four of the original drawings by Moreau Le Jeune for the famous edition of the Monument du Costume, made between 1775 and 1783, one of the most iconic documents of 18th century court life. Garnitures of Sèvres porcelain, sculpture, and on one wall a magnificent gilt bronze mounted commode, by Jean-Henri Riesner, made in 1776 for Louis XVI's sister-in-law, the Comtesse de Provence, and one of the finest pieces of French furniture now at Wadston. It was bought by the dealer Wertheimer for £2,310 in 1882, at a time when Ferdinand was making some of his most, most important purchases. And Alice later bought another similarly magnificent Riesner commode of 1778, but this time made for Madame Elisabeth, Louis XVI's sister. She had more of a taste for painted furniture than her brother, for example, the demi lune commode painted in grisaille on a blue ground with gilt bronze mounts, which was attributed to René Dubois, which can also be seen in her sitting room in the 1910 stereoscopes. But one of the most important elements of, of the Wadston collection was what Ferdinand referred to as his Renaissance Museum, the 16th and 17th century ivory, Limoges enamels, goldsmith's work, myolica, glass and rock crystal, which he had assembled into an extraordinary example of a 19th century Kunstkammer. This collection, latterly displayed in the smoking room at Wadston, was bequeathed in its entirety to the British Museum on Ferdinand's death in 1898 and where it remains today as the Wadston bequest. Alice was his executor, and so it fell to her to organize the transfer. And of course, what the bequest did was also to create a major gap in the way the collections were displayed. While others might have seen this as an opportunity to diversify, Alice appears to have been determined to preserve the character of the bachelor's wing, and indeed other interiors of the house as they had, had been. So she set about filling the smoking room with a close approximation of what had been there before. Her acquisitions, though made in quantity, were nonetheless discerning and were made over a considerable length of time, which suggests a strong personal enthusiasm for such objects. 
As most of you will know, information about how and from where or whom the Rothschilds were buying their works of art can be very patchy. Records of acquisitions were often deliberately not kept, and Alice comes into this category. She had all of her personal papers destroyed after her death. However, we now know more about how she was buying, thanks to the accidental discovery of several sets of receipts at Wadston. These do not tell the full story, but show a steady stream of acquisitions from 1904, slowing after the outbreak of the First World War, and then resuming at a slower pace in 1918, including enamels, myolica, serve, gold boxes and paintings, and arms and armour. I am getting to the arms and armour. Some of the major names of the commercial art world were represented. The selection shown here are from Wertheimer and Harding, but the majority record transactions with the picture dealers Charles Davis and Colnagi and the furniture porcelain and objet d'art specialist Derlacher Brothers, all in London. And she also acquired objects from Seligman in Berlin and j &A Goldschmidt in Frankfurt and in London. Ferdinand had a small collection of arms and armour. His probate inventory, taken in 1898, lists trophies of arms and various articles on the walls, displayed in what was then called the Billiard Room Corridor, the main access to the bachelor's wing from the main house, and which led to both the billiard and the smoking rooms, the latter, of course, the home of the Renaissance Museum. And a few of Ferdinand's arms are still at Wadston. They include a collection of early 17th century, possibly Netherlandish and Swiss halberds, um, French 18th century pistols, um, and a Piquet powder flask from the Spitzer collection, which in, 1980, which in 1898 was in his private sitting room, and a group of knives displayed in the smoking room. Alice, however, greatly expanded this holding. She was mainly interested in 16th and 17th century pieces, in particular swords, daggers, firearms, and powder flasks, with the emphasis on decoration rather than driven by history or typology. They come mainly from the great European centres of production in Italy, Germany, Austria, the Low Countries, France and Britain. Although several pieces have illustrious provenances, what her brother liked to call association seems to have been less important to her. Like Ferdinand, she generally did not keep records of where she was acquiring the pieces, apart from the receipts that we mentioned earlier. But she made a few notes on provenance in a handwritten set of notes entitled Catalogue of the Principal Pictures, etc. She seems to have largely bought privately rather than at auction. Some pieces came from some of the major late 19th and early 20th century collections, such as those of Hollingsworth Maniac, Richard Schwiller, and of course, Spitzer. But the main influence on the formation of the collection was Sir Guy Francis Laking, one of the foremost connoisseurs of arm and armor, arms and armor at the time. Laking really deserves a lecture all to himself, and I have to say that in preparing for this talk, I've now become slightly obsessed with Laking because he was such an extraordinary character. He's one of the most prominent, intriguing, and colorful personalities of the early 20th century art market. And in all of what follows on Laking, I'm indebted to the late Claude Baer, author of the Wadsden Arms and Armor catalog, and himself a foremost authority in the field, and who wrote the introduction to the 2000 re-edition of Laking's immense and seminal work, a record of European arms and armour through seven centuries, which was first published in 1920-22 to 22 in five volumes. Laking was born in 1875, the son of Sir Francis Laking, who was physician to the royal household. He therefore had close connections to the royal family from an early age, which greatly helped in his later career. He was passionate about arms and armour from boyhood, and by the time he was 21, was acting as art advisor for Christie's. At 24, in 1900, he was appointed honorary inspector of the armories at the Wallace Collection. Then two years later, King Edward VII created the post of keeper of the King's armory at Windsor, specially for him. Later, from 1911 to 1919, he was instrumental in setting up the London Museum, now of course the Museum of London, becoming its first keeper. All of this demonstrates both the level and extent of his scholarship, but also his extraordinary reputation and the high regard in which he was held. This regard was no doubt enhanced by his legendary charm. He seems to have been loved by almost everyone who knew him, not least by women, it has to be said. Um, he had various sort of affairs and entanglements. His great kindness, his immense generosity, and his wild extra extravagance. He was renowned for his expensive tastes, which extended to his personal collection of arms and armour, and you can see him wearing some of this personal collection in the slide on the screen now. And his lavish parties, 
Famously, he entertained the members of the Merrick Society, which was a, um, uh, a club of arms and armor collectors, to a medieval feast in his home, which included a banquet, the centerpiece of which was roast peacock in its feathers, and his children's governess dressed up in armor and handing round a, lo a loving cup. This photograph of him in costume shows him as the esquire of the Knight Marshal of the Lists, taking part in a tournament he helped to organize um, as part of the triumph presented at Shakespeare's England, which took place in London to great acclaim in 1912. Also, as Claude Blair makes very clear, this celebrity lifestyle was impossible to sustain on the income that Lay King made from his various jobs. His friend Oswald Barron wrote that he spent money like one who has a store of gold angels and gold nobles in an iron chest, rather than one who draws checks on a banking account. Laking was frequently in debt, and it seems only too likely that he supplemented his income with commissions and fees from advice given on purchases to both dealers and his wealthy collector friends, who, ass who he assiduously cultivated. It also gave him opportunities for double dealing and occasionally encouraging the purchase of objects that he knew to be either problematic or outright fakes. Although we don't know exactly when they met, Laking was closely involved as an advisor to Alice in the formation of her arms and armor collection. At the same time, he was also advising William Waldorf Astor, first Viscount Astor, who was furnishing his newly bought house, Hever Castle in Kent. Alice was clearly susceptible to his charm and regarded him as a friend. Um, he, he appears in the visitor's book at Wasden, for example. Um, and he was one of the few people singled out for a specific legacy in her will of a thousand pounds, which was a considerable sum at the time. Although some of the more doubtful pieces at Wadsdam were probably brought under the eye of Laking, he also ensured that she acquired some important objects too. He was instrumental in her purchase of the most important pieces in the collection, a helmet which was part of a parade armour made for Emperor Charles V, probably made by Caramolo Modrone, who was born in Mantua and then worked there for the Gonzaga from 1512. Aside from imperial commissions, he also worked for Charles de Bourbon and Anne de Montmorency. And he was, Laking was also involved in the acquisition of this pair of 1539 elbow pieces from another of Charles V's parade armors by Filippo Negroli from the famous Milanese family of armorers, renowned for the quality of their embossing. Like the helmet, they were, in, they were illustrated in the Inventario Umilando, the, the illustrated inventory of Charles V's armory. Alice probably bought them directly from the collection of Baron Charles Alexander de Cosson, a great authority on arms and armor, who was also a friend of Laking. In another mark of her affection for him, both the elbow pieces and the helmet were also left to Laking in Alice's will, listed as embossed helmet of Charles V, also pair of elbow pieces of Negroli in the armory at Wadston. And they only remain in the collection at the manor because Laking died before she did, in 1919, at the young age of 44. These shoulder and arm defences were made for Giuseppe Mattei, Duke of Giove, possibly in Rome or Brescia, around, 15, around 1750. Together with the helmet and elbow pieces, they form part of a small group of body armour, which also includes collars and shields. The most important of these was also prompted by Laking. This circular parade shield, probably made in the Antwerp workshop of Elysius Liberts around 1555 for Henri II, embossed in low relief with battle scene based on designs after Etienne de Lone, which came from the celebrated collection of Sir Adam Hay. It was exhibited at the Special Exhibition of Works of Art on loan at the South Kensington Museum in 1862, where it was described as Italian work of the 16th century, like lots of things at this time. It was also at various points ascribed to Benvenuto Cellini. In the 1830s, it had been associated with Francois Premier. At Wadsden, there are pieces of high quality, such as this pair of pistols made by one of the outstanding Paris gunsmiths in the second half of the 17th century, De Grange, signed on the lock plate and inlaid with silver and silver gilt and the figures of war and fame, and this German wheel lock gun made in the last quarter of the 16th or early 17th century, its stock elaborately inlaid with engraved mother of pearl and staghorn. But there are also pieces that have been added to, altered, remade and redecorated, many of which had a, collection to, had a connection sorry, to Frederick Spitzer, the collector and dealer who became notorious after his death for his interventions and inventions, and Laking must have been very, very well aware of these. Alice was collecting at the end of a period when the market for arms and armour, particularly Renaissance and later pieces, was very buoyant, thanks to the activities of several wealthy collectors, most notably Sir Richard Wallace, 
and so the trade had responded to meet the demand. There was also increasing competition from America, and particularly Bashford Dean, curator of arms and armour at the Met Metropolitan Museum in New York, who likewise had a, had a network of wealthy collectors. Alice was also buying intensively and at speed, as the surviving results show. For example, Derlacher, who, su who supplied considerable quantities of the arms and armour collection from 1908 onwards, billed Alice in June 1909 for a pair of Deruta dishes, a pair of Louis XVI candelabra, a fine gilt steel hilted sword, French, and gold inlaid rapier, Henri II, a dagger and sheath, Italian, circa 1530, an inlaid wood flask, damascened, German, 16th century, an embossed cartridge box, a small metal flask, a knife, French, Henri II, and a left-handed dagger and sheath, circa 1570, all for a total of £1,273. This buying of objects in bulk is not unusual, but it gives, also gives a sense of how Alice's taste was developing and also her pursuit of highly decorated continental rapiers, swords and daggers. The following year, one receipt alone in July 1910 lists a pair of pistols, German, circa 1590, untouched, rare on account of the brass bands. A small pair of 17th century pistols, silver mounts, signed by Lazzarino Cominazzo, and these are the ones that are on the screen at the moment. A large gilt powder flask, mythological subjects, German, 16th century. A carved ivory powder flask, 16th century, all for 500 pounds. The pistols are inscribed with the name Brento, an Italian centre of gun making between Florence and Bologna, and date to the second half of the 18th century. The barrels, though, were provided and signed by a member of the most famous family of Brescian gunsmiths, who were active from the late 16th and into the 18th century and who specialised in gun barrels. As we've already heard, Alice concentrated on specific types of objects. Swords and rapiers are the largest group, supplemented by daggers and knives. This example has an English pommel and hilt with silver foliage and flowers of the kind fashionable at the court of James I. But the blade does not fit and is possibly replaced. It bears the mark of Christoph Stendler, who died in 1601, a Munich-based swordsmith working in the second half of the 16th century. The wooden grip, bound with copper ribbon and wire, is also a replacement. It's typical of rapiers that often appear as fashionably elegant accessories in courtly portraits of the period. On this example, the blade bears two marks, the famous makers from Toledo, Spain, and Brescia in Italy, which suggests that it was made in Solingen in Germany, where it was common practice to add spurious signatures to increase value. Alice brought several similarly decorated rapiers for display. This one also came from Durlacher. Um, described as a ring-hilted ring rapier, straight quillens encrusted with vine ornaments, and serpents in silver and fire gilt in panels. The blade is inscribed Sandri Scacchi, North Italian, second half of the 16th century. And along with another rapier, left-hand dagger, spurs, and presentoir, this bill came to £2,000. This purchase in 1908 was the largest group bought from Derlacher and also included this rapier, which on the basis of an almost identical example in the royal collection, made for James I and signed, is attributed to La Roche d'Argent. Laking, as keeper of the Windsor Armouries, knew the royal collections intimately and so must have encouraged Alice to buy this closely comparable example. Firearms are the other most significant category, particularly wheel lock rifles and pistols, and like the rapiers and swords, acquired for their decorative features. Most have intricately worked barrels and stocks, and together form an impressive array. This is one of the most outstanding, made in the 1670s by Christian Erolt, a leading Dresden gunmaker. The stock appears to be made originally without the intention to set it with the five enameled plucks. Some of the inlaid staghorn decoration is covered by them. It was made by an unidentified stockmaker who also supplied stocks to Balthazar Herolt, active 1631 to 1680, and other Dresden gun makers. The plaques were made to fit the stock, however, as they follow the contours of the wood. This may indicate an innovation hit upon by Christian to make these fairly run-of-the-mill stocks more fashionable and desirable. Herold belonged to a distinguished family of Dresden gun makers, whose, mi whose members also worked as enamelers and painters in the Meissen porcelain manufactory. By contrast, this rifle, with its extraordinarily decorated stock and barrel, is an example of 19th century invention. The ornament is derived from the Prince of Etienne de Lone, but the original barrel was probably 16th or 17th century and plain. In the 19th century, the metal was blued, catering for late 19th century taste for highly decorated guns, and decorated with leaves, grotesques, and figures. 
it was gilded, and finely decorated sections with a technique known as counterfeit damascening, where thin gold wires are set into the base metal. The lock is similarly decorated. It will not surprise you at all to know that it was probably put together in the workshop of Frederick Spitzer. The chisel decoration is comparable with that found on some of the guns Ferdinand is known to have acquired from Spitzer that are now in the Wadsden bequest in the British Museum. Powder flasks form another distinct and large group, many of them decorated with engraved ivory or staghorn, and several of these also come from the Spitzer collection. The gilded bronze, fa bronze flask, shaped like an antler horn, traditionally used to store powder that was loaded into the gun barrel with a bullet, is intricately cast and chased with hunting vignettes loosely related to prints by Jost Amann and was probably made in Augsburg. Also on the screen is another Spitzer collection piece, an ivory flask dated 1584, engraved with figures and scenes after Virgil Solis and Jost Amann, probably made in Nuremberg and with the crest of the Imhoff family. So, why did Alice collect these arm, this arms and armour so av avidly? Um, I'm very aware that in this lecture I haven't really looked at other Rothschilds as collectors um, of arms and armour, such as Salomon, for example, who also collected in the field. So, um, I can't really say uh, what influence other family members may have had on Alice, aside, of course, from her brother. But if we assume that the main impulse was to preserve the character of the bachelor's wing and add to the pieces from her brother's collection that remained at the manor, it must be that the relationship with Laking was the key. Whether he was a friend to whom she turned when she began the project, or whether the friendship grew out of what was originally a commercial relationship, we don't know. But Alice was intensely loyal and generous to those she was fond of. Remember, for example, the generosity of the bequest to her companion, Clarissa Watkin. A similar degree of affection and recognition is visible in her bequest to Laking, on a par with other legacies to those in her inner circle. It is also telling, I think, that the surviving receipts suggest that she made no significant purchase after Laking's death in 1919, although by then, Alice herself was in declining health. So how does the display of the objects now reflect Alice's arrangement? The short answer is that we don't know, although the current layout is based on that devised by Dorothy de Rothschild, who oversaw the opening of the manor to the public after 1957 when it was bequeathed to the National Trust by her husband, James. She knew the manor in Alice's time, having visited soon after her marriage, and had the greatest respect for her husband's great aunt, so we presume that the arrangement was either inherited or was closely based on Alice's. It, certain, it certainly emphasizes visual impact rather than arrangement by maker, technique, type or period. When Lord Rothschild took over the management of the manor in 1988, the armory corridor, as it is now known, was redisplayed again, this time with the help of the interior designer David Milanaric, architect Peter Inskip, keeper of the collection Rosamond Griffin and art historian Alain Gruber, but with the aim of evoking the arrangement in Alice's day, which I think it does very well. So thank you very much for that. And also, just before I finish, I want to urge those of you who are interested in the arms and armour per se to go and look at the, uh, the online collection on the Wadston website. And I also want to thank my former colleague, Philippa Plock, who catalogued the whole collection and put it on the website. So the entries there are very full um, and very detailed and very worth a look if you are interested in the subject. Thank you very much.